Um, my name is Andrew Benny. Good afternoon. I'm the VP of Recruitment Services at Springer Publishing Company. And today we're really excited to welcome our guest, Dr. James Lanny. Dr. James Lanny is the founder and CEO of Intellectus Statistics. He's been assisting faculty and graduate students with their quantitative research for over two decades. Our goal with this webinar is to improve your quantitative research skills, to reduce anxiety around statistics and increase your confidence in conducting research. We're so excited to have Dr. Lanny join us today. But before we begin, please note that Dr. Lanny's colleague, Melissa, will be available to answer any questions throughout the webinar in our Q&A and chat feature. Uh, you should see that right to the right. And all questions are welcome, so please don't hesitate to send us your questions all throughout the webinar. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Lanny. Hello and welcome all. Um, I am so happy to be here and I'm so happy that um, there are many people from literally around the globe. Um, I was really gratified to see people from uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina to California. Canada is on the line. India, Australia. I don't know what time it is over there. Um, Lebanon. So really we have a, a you know, what we have is a global community here that are looking to develop professionally. And I'm grateful to be part of that process. If I do my job right, um, everyone will, will have a much better sense of you know, really how to design uh, different um, uh, statistical analyses, actually conduct them, and then learn how to present them as well. So if I can move um, every one of you a step further in, in these uh, areas, that would be terrific. And then we'll close with a Q and A. Um, and as Andrew said, please do throw in chat. Feel free to you know chat away, and um, and, and, and Melissa will you know feed me the, the chats uh, as appropriate. Okay, so um, designing, conducting, presenting. So really, what we're talking about here is um, again being able to figure out what statistical test is appropriate based on the research question based on the level of measurement of the data, of the variables. And um, so those two things are gonna move us along. The conducting, we're gonna figure out how do we manage data so we can actually conduct the analyses that we wanna conduct. And then certainly in the presentation part, how do we present just signal? And most things are presented in APA format and um, globally. So we wanna make sure we have just the signal and just the way that it needs to be uh, presented with tables and figures and the appropriate interpretation. So with that being said, let me jump to, uh, let me jump to the first part of, of designing. I also wanna say there's a diversity of disciplines uh, that, are, that are here, uh, not only geographically diverse, but discipline diverse. Um, Counseling, nursing, physical therapy, pharmacy, social work, economics, education, and psychology. So um, the, the principles that I'll be hopefully illuminating today um, really does um, span all of those disciplines. Okay, so designing and conducting about 43, 43, 45%. Okay, um, cool. So let's spend some time doing that. All right, so the, 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 let, let's just start with the beginning, right? So the, the core thing is we want to understand what is the research question being asked? Melissa, before I get started, you better interrupt me before 15 minutes before this is over, okay? okay. Uh, so I'm on track here. So we want to understand what the research question is. And the way that you phrase that research question drives the type of analysis. So. Let me just peek at something here. Uh, let me just look at data. So let's just look at some data real quick. I mean, I could ask the question, you know, just using uh, engagement pre and gender. I can say, does gender predict or impact engagement scores? That's one way of phrasing it. I could ask, are there differences on engagement pre scores by male or female? It's a second way, looking at differences. Or I can say, is there a relationship between gender and engagement pre? I could do point by serial correlation. So the phraseology is really important in before we get started here. So we need to know 
what do I want to do? Am I summarizing data? Am I examining differences? Again, maybe on my engagement scores by gender. Am I trying to predict engagement from gender? Or I'm just trying to relate them back and forth. So how we phrase that with describing, predicting, examining differences or relationships, that's going to help us get us into the appropriate bucket here, OK? All right, that's one thing. We have to know two other things be, to, to help with this designing piece, OK? One is we need to know levels of measurement. And um, so we, we, we need to know that all variables, uh, and I'm excluding uh, you know, qualitative responses. So we, I mean, we basically, we have three buckets of, of, of levels of measurement, right? We have nominal, which is Latin for name only. So male, female, Republican, Democrat, green, and so forth. Nominal level. We have ordinal level, which is ordered data. Okay, so small, medium, supersized at Coca-Cola. So they, there's an order, but not necessarily equal intervals. And then there's ratio uh, data, which is kind of, you know, an age or things of this sort. Straight up numbers of, you know, Likert type scale items, things of that sort. Okay. We have the way that we phrase it. We have level of measurement. The other piece is just to know, are we talking about an outcome variable, like a dependent variable? Are we talking about an independent variable? Okay. Or are we talking about a covariate, a variable that we want to neutralize the effect for? So once we have those three pieces, okay, phraseology, levels of measurement, and IVDV, covariate, we can really walk along um, our, our decision tree to, to design our, you know, our, our analysis. So for example, and we, and I'm using Inflectus as a scheme, but these, um, um, these decision trees can be found, you know, online and it's typical just to kind of walk through it. So, you know, I want to predict an outcome that happens to be scale. I'll be doing a linear regression. Or you can interactively say, I want to predict an outcome. That's scale. I'm doing a linear regression. Okay. I can examine differences over time. Uh, there's a lot of nurses um, on this um, uh, webinar. And there's a lot of these quality improvement projects, as you all know. And uh, they're doing a lot of you know, paired sample t-tests. Uh, but you can get there by kind of saying, well, I want to explore differences over time. I have one DV, maybe knowledge or engagement, free to post. Okay, um, it's 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 not grouped. Okay, and there's no covariates, and there's just two time points. I'm doing a paired t-test, so you can walk along these trees and the branches thereof um, to kind of figure out what test to conduct. Okay, alrighty, so. And I guess I, let me just, um, before we do that, I just want to put out to you all, are there any questions around that? Because really, if we don't have the right test that matches the research question or hypothesis, we're kind of starting off on the wrong foot. So are there any questions about that as we uh, move along here? And, um, okay, so let me just see here. Um, Okay. There is a question um, asking if the decision tree helps with parametric or non-parametric data. Great question. So um, it helps with both. So the I'm sure there's more sophisticated decision trees than this. This is really driving us to the most common analyses, um, but it's not driving us to time series or structural equation modeling or things like that. And so these common analyses are both parametric and non-parametric. And you can see uh, where I just was, you know, the, the, the um, paired t-test, right, is a, is a, is a parametric um, way to look at differences pre to post. But if the assumptions were not met, we can use the Wilcoxon, which is non-parametric. So the, the, the tree gets you to a lot of the common ones, both parametric and non-parametric. We also have a question about, um level of measurement 
And it says, I've been told that Likert scales are not ratio data. How do you classify Likert scale items? So I looked into this because this is one of those common, you know, philosophical, but also empirical <laughs> uh, kind of questions out there. So the rule of thumb is um, with likely type scales, well, let's just start from the beginning. Uh, how are we gonna take this? So let's just say we have a five point Likert scale, right? And we have different items, right? And we need to average those items to create a construct. Okay, well, how are we gonna do that with strongly disagree, agree, agree strongly, neutral? You can't, you need numbers. So you need to turn those ordinal Likert type into numbers to be able to average them or sum them. And I would just use the analogy of, you know, when we were all in school, taking a test, you got the item number, you know, the 100 question test and you got the first question, right or wrong. Well, right or wrong, correct or incorrect, that's a nominal, that's a nominal measurement there, right? It's either yes, correct or incorrect for each item. But when I sum them, right, right, I'm turning them into numbers now from nominal into scale to be able to sum them. So that's some response to it. The rule of thumb is if you have five or more items. Um, you, uh, there's, there's no deficit or downside to making them a ratio or excuse me, uh, making them um, uh, uh, interval or ratio at, or scale and then summing them. If you have three items, uh, excuse me, three levels or four in that Likert, um, maybe just keep it that way. And um, Melissa, what we can do is we, we wrote a blog about this and we have references about people using researchers using these uh, Likert as, um, uh, as scale and what those results were. Okay, other questions? Any other, any other questions about this before we kind of uh, move along here? Nope, I think you can go ahead and move on. Okay, terrific. Okay, so, you know, um, really finding out for your own research and for students' research, you know, what am I trying to do, okay? All right. And by the way, when you ask that question, and maybe the thing to do is to kind of run it with differences, uh, run it with relationships and run it with prediction, because the way you ask the question drives the test, but you also did get a different kind of result, right? So, and we'll get into that right now. Before we conduct though, okay, we need to manage. So let's go to management. So, well, in, the, in this particular platform, you can change those levels of measurement. So, you know, if I thought, well, condition I have pre post follow up, it could be nominal, but it's really there's an order there. So I might want to make them ordinal and, um, and, and, and fix that first. Okay. So that looks hunky dory, you know, replace. So you want to get that right level of measurement there. If these are, um, well, in this platform, and I'm not sure about Excel or SPSS or others, you know, you, you, you would want nominal to, which is name only, to actually have that data in there. That is the, the labels of it. You don't need this kind of archaic um, kind of, I'm going to number them and I have to remember zeros are males, ones are females, and so forth. So. Um, you would want to change that. Uh, any 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 um, item that comes in a scale, you you and it's truly nominal or ordinal. You'll want to put in those labels. So getting those um, items in the right level of measurement is critical. Okay. Other things we'd want to do here. Um, you may want to um, impute um, items that are missing. So if you have 10 items, right? 10 separate questions, and you want to create a subscale, and someone just happened to miss an item, you don't want to throw out that whole individual. So what you can do is go to impute, okay, which replaces both nominal or scale variables. Okay. So I can go to impute. All of these in this tool, all of these uh, variables are missing a variable. I'm, I'm missing a case. So let's just go to engagement pre. 
So it's imputing a um, that missing cell. So now I can, you know, sum them if I wanted to. So you'll want to do things like, you know, unless you have a huge sample size, you know, you, you'll you'll want to keep, you know, as many cases as you have. Um, a lot of these are really tough to get. That is data. <laughs> And um, so you, you want to save them as, as much as you can. You may want to get rid of outliers. Particular tests are very finicky with outliers. And, um, and you can just imagine um, a, you know, looking at a, a t-test, okay, and saying, are there differences on engagement by gender? And instead of, <laughs> instead of a, a 33, I had 333. Well, gosh. That's going to really set these differences off for for males averages versus female averages. So you, you you'll want to do things like compute missing data. You'll want to get rid of outliers. You'll want to create composite scores through a variable calculator of some sort. Um, Excel makes it very very simple to you know create composite scores or average scores. Um, with these parametric tests. Sometimes if normality is not met, it's helpful to transform the variable. And what I mean by that is that when you have, this is a variable engagement pre, and this is what it looks like, but that might not meet the bell-like curve of which normality would be um, uh, compared to. So you may want to transform them, and there's different common transformations. Um, and, and, and most tools or all tools will have um, different transformation types. And you can see the impact, well, at least in this tool, the, you know, of, the, of the, the, the impact of having a cube root on, on that data set. So you can see if it looks more normal or not prior to creating that variable. So transformations can be an option. Binning may be an option. So um, this would be just for, if you have a set of data, but you said, you know what? I don't really care like individual scores of engagement. What I care is people that are engaged and people that are not. And uh, maybe I'll set the, you know, 30. So if, if, if you had a, you know, engagement score greater than 30, you were engaged. If you were less than 30, you were not engaged. And maybe that's how you want to break it up. So managing your data is an important aspect of prior to conducting. People get mixed up with um, structuring their data. <laughs> um, so there's lots of ways Excel um, has a great, uh, can I just do this real quick? Yeah. Um, so Excel has a nice thing when you when you copy it, okay, and then you can paste uh, just by right clicking and then paste um, this way, transpose. So Excel has got nice functionality for that. Um, we also have other um, functionality to help you sort that data. By the way, it would be either either with this tool or with other tools. You can look to see how data is laid out. In our tool, we just say, you know, if I'm doing an ANOVA, okay, math and favorite color on my DV and IV of interest. And you can see how um, these are laid out, right? So color and, and, and favorite color and, um, you know, uh, math scores are side by side. Sometimes you want them stacked, sometimes you want them side by side. You can look at those example data sets for the analysis that you're going to conduct to see how that data is laid out. And I think you could probably Google around and look at if you're using state or SPSS or other things um, and look at that data set or look at those videos and see how that data is laid out. Because it has to be laid out. That's part of a data management task is to make sure the data is in the appropriate format. Okay. It may also be helpful to plot data um, just to kind of get a feel for what you're dealing with here. 
Um, so we'll look at descriptives in a second, but but certainly plotting is also helpful. So um, I might want to box plot engagement free to kind of see, oh, here's the min and the max, okay? Here's the median and so forth. So you may want to look at different graphing techniques just to kind of get a feel for your data. Um, so that was a box plot, here's a histogram. Let's see what that looks like. And you can get a sense of the shape of it, right? There's very few people with you know, low uh, engagement uh, post scores, very few with very high, you know, and you got a bunch of folks in the middle here. So, um, and it almost looks kind of flat. So in terms of the number of people that have um, each of these. So it's just kind of, Nice just to play around and it just takes a second just to kind of look at, you know, what does my data look like? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just look at one more quick one. Um, if I'm interested in engagement pre and engagement post scores is kind of the example at the moment. Um, so let's put pre and post. I'm just running a scatter plot. So um, Engagement pre, ah, I have engagement pre and engagement pre. Of course, it's perfect. Okay. That looks like it's got more diversity there. So um, even looking at um, variables of interest graphically, I might say, you know, maybe that female is an outlier. Um, you know, it seems like these folks are all kind of increasing as engagement pre increases, post increases. Um, but this one looks like a little, little weird, or maybe uh, this guy up here. So you should look at the data graphically. You can just peek at it. Just run a few things. You can look at, you know, for each group. Okay. It's, it's, it's kind of nice to look at, hey, what's the relationship between pre and post test scores? Are they related at all or not? Well, you can see here without even asking that overall, yeah, pre and post data are related. And for females, pre and post engagement scores are related, but not for males. So just graphically, you can get a feel for what's happening there, even before we conduct any analysis. Right. Let's make sure the variables are labeled uh, with the right level of measurement. Let's make sure that we've imputed or got rid of outliers or created composite scores. So doing those basic kind of tasks. By the way, this data management is analogous to grading, okay? It's the worst part of the job. It's the worst part of the job because it takes a long time and um, the analysis takes, you know, one minute, 30 seconds. But doing this is just the necessary task at hand here, okay? So if it takes 90% of your time, don't despair. That's kind of how it goes. Okay plots, uh, and then the analysis part. So um, no, no matter what you do, <laughs> no matter what you do, run descriptives on everything that you're involved with here. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have gender, pre and engagement pre and post is what I'm, what I'm working with. Well, I'll throw in condition. So run descriptives, both frequencies and means as appropriate. So what I mean by that is that um, for nominal and ordinal variables, you need to run frequency and percentages. Because if this is just a, if you had just two individuals there at the post, at the follow-up, you're not gonna be able to do much with that, all right? If you had a major dis, uh, unbalance between males and females, you know what, maybe you wanna kick out the males and just say, look, let me just use the females and only generalize to females. For the scale variables, you're gonna to want to look at certainly the min and max. Can anybody tell me why you would wanna look at the min and max at all? All right, I'll give you the answer. I'm supposed to be teaching something here. So this is for data entry errors, really, for me. 
If I have a 444, an outlier is nice job. Yay. So, right. So, if there's somebody that's way out there at 444, it might be a real number, but it may not be. So, that's a good way to catch that. Now, and I and I and I'll give a shout out to our my my deceased stats teacher from 30 years ago who always told me, run descriptive statistics. You know how long it took me to do that? It took me 10 years. And what happened? I ran it, I had an outlier, as uh, MH said, and I and I didn't catch it. I ran all the analysis, then what? Then I had to go run everything again. So save yourself time and look, run descriptives. It just takes a second, but it's incredibly informative um, about prior to conducting analyses. All right. Let's conduct a few things. So let's say that my research question is, you know, um, are there differences from engagement pre to engagement post? So um, I have engagement pre, and then I have some educational intervention. Um, I'm engaging um, patients to get more social support for their depression, whatever it is. I'm looking, are there differences pre to post? Okay. So one thing we can do is go to that decision tree, right? And I can say, I want to explore differences over time, pre to post. I have one DV. Um, I have one DV measured at multiple time points. Yep. Um, I don't have groups and I don't have covariates and I only have two time points. So that's the pair T test. So then I can go and click the pair T test and here I am. So I wanna put in um, the engagement pre and I wanna see if there's differences after my intervention to engagement post. And by the way, in this tool, we're just really selecting the test, selecting the variables to calculate. Um, SPSS, you're gonna have to go in and, um, so some people don't even look at assumptions, you gotta look at assumptions. Everybody, I mean, even if it's undergrad, I'm gonna recommend looking at assumptions. I mean, let's, you know, that's my opinion. So for this t-test, we want to understand that A, there are assumptions, one of which is normality. Here is the test, but you can also just, um, I think Laird has got a great um, inexpensive, um, uh, if you just Googled Laird and a pair t-test, they're going to lay out all those assumptions, okay? And probably how to, uh, uh, and what test to use. So that's a really great resource. Um, I like them very much. Again, inexpensive. And they go through for SPSS, um, you know, what all those assumptions are and probably where to find them. Here, we just pack them into the test itself. So one assumption is normality, assessed with Shapiro-Wilkes. This tool happens to run it and then interpret it. So it's going to be nice to know that when um, assumptions are significant, eh, that's bad. That means it's violated. All right. Other assumptions. Okay. So this assumption is the data looks like a normal bell curve. That's the normality assumption. Homogeneity of variance. That's just basically saying those standard deviations are similar. And boy, they're almost dead on, right? Okay, and that assumption of homogeneity of variance or similar variances, okay, we can see that when we ran it, when it was run, it is not significant and that assumption was met. Okay. You also have to, well, and we'll talk about assumptions a little bit more in a moment. We also have to show students how to write this and for our own research, how do we report a pair of t-tests? This tool shows you how to do it, but you can also just look in any of journals within your discipline and say, how did they write a petit test? So um, you, you, you want to have that, um, you know, state the significance, present the um, T value, the T value and the P value in an appropriate way. And for sure, you want to be able to interpret that in a, in a simple fashion. This may not be the way you want to interpret it. You may want to say, Engagement was higher than pre, not engagement pre was lower. So know that 
um, you, you need to put that interpretation. That really kind of suits your research question. Okay. I'm here, and I'll get into the presentation in a moment, but just to know, you should probably, you know, have appropriate tables and plots to go with that. Uh, this tool does that, but you, sh you should know that, hey, gosh, I need to share the means and standard deviations. I need to share the T value, the P value, and then, th th then the effect size. Okay. All right. So I think we're ready for a, um, um, a, a poll question. Yeah. Okay. So what would you or your students do in this t-test example where the assumptions were violated, but maybe the results were the way you wanted it? Hey, my intervention worked. You know, um, what, what would I do there? Because it does show that my intervention worked, right? I have higher engagement scores, but what do I do about those finicky assumptions? So you can respond to it there. You have a few choices. Nothing, ignore it. Conduct a non-parametric, transform the data. Maybe get rid of outliers. I don't know. We have a few more answers trickling in, but I think I'll close it. <laughs> okay. All right, what do we have here? All right, good job. So, um, so conduct non-parametric is one answer. You can, there, it's kind of a trick question because you could have also trans, um, transform the data, right? To get to um, make, um, uh, to make the data more normally distributed. So, um, our answer or one answer is also to run that non-parametric test. This tool just runs it automatically. That non-parametric equivalent test can be gotten in a few ways. One is in that decision tree, we saw that the paired t-test and Wilcoxon, that's the parametric and non-parametric to examine differences of a variable like engagement over time. So that's one way to get at it. The other way is so, and you can just run that. Um, and there's lots of SPSS videos. I'm sure Excel's um, stat package runs it as well. And um, and then obviously analogously to the uh, t-test, I mean you have to write it up and just look in journals to see. Well, you can look in journals to see how it's written up, and and then and then how that might be interpreted as well and what the appropriate plots may be with that. And here we can also see, hey gosh, there was a difference, using the Wilcoxon, there was differences from pre to post engagement, all right? So let's, um, well, mediation moderation is lots of regression. So uh, let's just go to that. We, um, we, we, I used to take a Baron and Kenny approach, um, you know, his 86 article, their 86 article was, you know, most of what we use, uh, but but, but uh, Preacher and um, uh, Hayes came up with, so this is what, you know, we use Baron and Kenny for these guys here, which is, um, I have two variables, right? And we'll see if X predicts Y, right? Um, you know, does, does pre, does, does, does pre-engagement predict post-engagement, um, but, is, is that strength of that relationship mediated uh, by gender or something like that, right? So mediators strengthen or weaken that relationship. Um, I keep saying mediation, it's moderation. So a moderating variable strengthens or weakens that relationship between two variables. Mediation is if I had uh, uh, engagement pre and engagement post, Mediators, um, the the impact of pre on post goes through the mediator. So, but what um, Hayes and Preacher came up with were these other kinds of models, which are very cool. You would just have to run them separately as separate regressions. I don't. I think Preacher and Hayes. You can go to um, uh, his website 
and I believe they'll have SPSS syntax. So you can just grab that syntax and then just put it into your SPSS syntax window. I don't think you'd want to do this in Excel, um, but you'd want to do it in, in Selectus or SPSS or you know some other platform. But these are much more, these are say popular um, different types of mediation and moderation models. So let me just do something simple. Here, I'm just, I'll select my outcome variable, post uh, IV is pre, and um, mediators, um, let's just say attention, okay. All right, so, so for sure, you know, again, I would grab that preacher syntax, and I think it's free. Um, put in my DV, my IV, and then my potential mediator. In this particular, in, in Intellectus, you have to go through the assumptions. So if you're in SPSS, you still have to look at assumptions of, um, uh, of these tests, one of which is normality, Okay, our, our, the Intellectus platform, you can just scroll over to see, oh, that looks normal or not normal. Okay, um, homoscedasticity. Okay, you'll wanna find out where that is. You'll wanna run that test and then you'll wanna interpret that test. And you can Google to see, you know, um, uh, images like we're showing here of homo and heteroscedatic uh, data. You'll wanna look at multicollinearity in it. So basically we're talking about, hey, hi, how highly correlated are these variables? Well, um, so you can just run a correlation between it. And if it's, you know, 0.9 or higher, you know, you, that's probably a problem. <laughs> um, so um, you'll, you'll wanna look at that. You'll wanna do an outlier analysis. And then the results, in, th in this tool, it actually runs it, makes APA tables, you know, it just simultaneously ran, you know, three regressions and tabled it. Um, but you'll you'll want to go through uh, and look and look at and interpret the direct and indirect effects of those. Okay. Okay. All right. Ah. Okay. Um, okay. And then someone sent an article. So okay. So nice. Okie doke. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to the presenting of it. We good with that, Melissa? Yep, I think so, and then Q&A, so. Yep, okay. So, you know, most, <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been around a long time, and um, what we used to have is, and not to say that I'm that old, but I'm pretty old. So we used to use punch cards, okay? And then the output used to be horrific. It was literally yellow and green, like line paper, and then you had to transpose it. And I think SPSS has a APA output. Um, I'm not sure about um, how easy it is to do that. I know Excel doesn't, but you may want to look to see the packages that you're using that can they help take that raw output and and and, and have some interpreted aspect of it. So they, they may be, this is what most of the world works with. And then I used to have to go format it. It's okay. Um, so this platform, you just download it <laughs> into a Word document. So an editable Word document. So um, so presentation, uh, really, you want the results. Let me get this. You're going you, you, to want the results, okay? And you're going to want the references, okay? For sure. So for all the in-text citations, as you write, you're gonna to wanna to reference that. Who said you have to look at normality? Well, you wanna reference that, okay? Um, in the text, and then you wanna put, I think for most folks here, you know, in APA style references. Just to share, this, this tool actually gives you a glossary too, and actually gives you our output, but, but what you're gonna most need for you and your students is the results and the references, okay? Um, and then tables in a proper format. So you'll want to look at that. Um, and again, I think you just grab other articles or see if this template's kicking around to kind of move you around. Because I know most folks don't have um, Intellectus, 
So, you know, you're going to have to work with, you know, SPSS and just look to see what you can do for that APA style. And then, um, and then just add the references and the citations underneath it. Um, okay. So I don't know what else I need to be saying about that. Um, I guess one thing is that when you're, sometimes as you're going through conducting analyses, you wind up doing things that are different, or you notice that you've there's assumptions that you've looked at. I want to say one helpful thing for students and for your own research is that you want to make sure that that data plan and that sample size in the in the, in the methodology matches your results. So if you have to go back and edit that uh, methodology, go back and edit that methodology. You don't have to go back to IRB, as far as I'm concerned. Someone may may weigh in differently, but um, I think it's normal to say, ah, as I looked at it, you know, I went from a, you know, a, a paired T test to a Wilcoxon because I didn't know it wasn't going to meet the assumption. So I'm going to have to change that uh, data plan and that methodology to, uh, re to reflect what I actually did. Or if I got rid of outliers, you know, that's something that should be stated. So you want total alignment between that methodology um, and and their results. So when when others are reading that methodology, they know what's coming, right? I know. Ah, I'm expecting a Wilcoxon as well. What else? Um, okay, I think I want to stop there. We're about two forty three. Um, maybe. Um, well, maybe, maybe maybe we'll just go to the Q and A. Is that I have one Q&A. Okay, so I have uh, one question. So I'm moving into Q&A, but I'll keep this open in case I, I need it. <laughs> um, you don't need to see a pretty picture of a uh, Q&A. Okay, so uh, what statistical analysis um, could be used for an assessment of, uh, uh, for an assessment? So, it, so, so let's go back. Good question. So what statistical analysis should I use? So we have to go back to the decision tree. So the what's important there is before I select the test, I need to understand those three components. How am I phrasing my question? A. What is the levels of measurement of my variables? B. And make sure I have IV, DV, and covariate in my brain. So I can so I can do that. Okay. So that's the response there. So you need you need to look at those items. Um, so there's a question about CFAs and SEM. You know, use Lizrule and Amos. Um, you know, so yeah, you know the <laughs> yeah, this platform was based on 20 years of consulting. So yeah, we we do have um, you know. So just to, I, I didn't, I'm, I'm trying to stay focused more on the teaching of it um, rather than the tool, but so yes. So it does SEM, PATH, CFA, um, and in the same simple way um, that uh, I, I've demonstrated some of these other ones. Uh, are there studies, articles, examples of reporting how intellectuals is used in methods? Yeah, so um, that's, uh, thanks. Um, I can put that in the chat too. Thank you, better. So this is the, Melissa, am I in the right spot here? Yep. You'll put uh, it in the chat. Okay, yeah. so yeah, there's hundreds of dissertations and peer reviewed research articles and so forth. So, you know, we're, you know, we're the best decade old secret. <laughs> um, okay. Other questions about, and I, I really do want to stay focused on helping you to do your own research and students. So um, I don't want to be as tool specific. So you can, you know, there's, you can call us or whatever, but or email us, but questions about the designing, the analyzing or managing of the data or presenting. So I want to kind of maybe stay focused there if I can. So uh, let me go to my PowerPoint. 
and then from current slide. So, well, just to say, with the tool, well, <laughs> just kind of contradicting myself, didn't want to talk about the tool. So the tool has got help pages, training sessions, video libraries, FAQs, reference manual, consulting. Okay. And we had a question about power analysis. So if you could show ah, Sure. So, um, so power analysis, so, um, so before you collect data, you need to know how many observations do I need, right? Or if, even if you're doing archival, like how many chart reviews do I need to be doing? So PASS has got a, um, a tool that you can purchase um, to help you with power analysis. G Power um, obviously is the go-to tool. It's free. I think it's German or Australian. And you know that you can really um, put in what effect size you actually want. Um, this tool, you know, we have all the different tests. Um, however, we've kind of limited it to power of 0 0.80. I want an 80% chance of finding differences if in fact they exist. Um, you know, I use the alpha 0 0.05. And whatever the particular effect size is for that test. So different tests have different, you know, a small effect size in a t test it, it, it may well be very different than a, a small effect size, um, you know, for a for a um, uh, for a regression. So, um, so you you, know, you can use Intellectus, you can use Pass. Um, Laird may have some um, comment on that. Um, and certainly um, uh, the past program. And then um, SPSS does have a module. I believe they do have a power module. So if you have SPSS, you've already invested, you know, just add to, add, add, the, um, add the power aspect of it. I should say for our, for the intellect that you can, you know, download that and edit that and, and stick it into your um, uh, methodology. And students can do the same, obviously. Uh, that's an important part, though the uh, the sample size, because every, everybody knows that you need more than two. And during COVID times, guess what? I'm not, it's going to be very difficult to get 400. So it was it was a real challenge. So there's a theoretical aspect, but there's also a practical aspect. There's no way I'm, on God's earth I'm going to get 400 folks or a thousand folks or whatever. So, other things about um, designing. This is your chance. Um, ask away, Jim. I struggle with designing around this. I struggle with the managing or conducting of that, and I have difficulty presenting this. All right, so um, I'm fine ending early. Um, <laughs> we had a quick question to walk through repeated measures ANOVA. Ah, okay, um, sure. And then we'll, uh, that's fine. So let's make sure we have the right data. So, um, so here we have uh, several visual scores. Okay, so, so let's get the research question right, right? Are there, if we're just using, you know, these guys, right? So the re, what is the research question? So the research question is, are there differences across time for visual scores? Okay. Differences. That's leading me to that ANOVA part. So let's just go back. So are there um, ex explored differences over time? I only have one dependent variable, in this case, visual. Uh, do I have any uh, groups? Nope. I just want to see if the difference is from visual one to visual two to visual three. Uh, no covariates that we mentioned. And are they measured? Um, how many time points? Three or more? Yep. Visual one, visual two, visual three. So I'm doing that repeated measures ANOVA. Or if the assumptions are violated, that Friedman. Okay. So let's get to it. So repeated measures ANOVA. Put in my DVs, visual one, visual two, visual three. Okay. And in this tool, again, you're just selecting the test, put in the variables, and confirm. So 
So as with other parametric tests, there's assumptions to look at. That looks picture perfect. Sphericity, other assumptions. So you'll want to look at Laird or Intellectus or Google to make sure that you're catching all of these um, different assumptions. Because you want it tight for the student. Uh, you don't want to get kicked back. Or if you're submitting to a journal article for a journal for yourself, you don't want to kick back. You want to cross all your T's, dot your I's, and you do that by going through all of the assumptions and documenting that. Then the results have to be you know, presented in plain English, right? Um, here, uh, there were significant differences, and we can peek at the means and say, ah, even better. You can see, oh gosh, uh, visual two looks like it has higher scores than at visual one or visual three. Great. You'll want to make sure in terms of that presentation at that table, the APA is just giving kind of guidelines. We follow those guidelines the best we can. So this may not be written in stone that you need effect size there, but I think I would say this is best practice, but you as the advisor might say, well, you know, I really want it this particular way. No problem. We had one um, follow-up question about presenting the data and would you show individual scores versus aggregate data? And then I think that might be all we have time for and okay. then we'll go to the contact slide. So you guys, if you have more questions, you can contact us. So I'm going to finish this one first. So the, so so this one is after you see the means, okay, then you once you have a significant difference, okay, you need to know which time different from which other time. You get looks like that's different, looks like that's different, looks like that's different here to here. But the um, the, the post hoc tests are going to tell you, hey, guess what? They're all different from each other. One to two, one to three, and two to three. That's different, that's different, and the cross is different, okay? And then here's that Friedman when that assumptions were violated. Okay, and then the uh, composites, average scores versus individual. I would never, ever, ever show individual scores. I would never present that data in anywhere. Now, I think the rule is you gotta keep it for five or seven years because it should be available to other folks. So you wanna keep the data, but in terms of presenting of it, no, that's it. That's the table two is it. Okay. And let's go to the um, current slide. Are we there, let's see here. Okay. So uh, if you'd like to learn more, feel free. If you have suggestions for other webinars, we would love to partner with Springer again and come back and say, you know what, let's just do a thing on regressions for an hour. Let's just do whatever. Um, so, you know, we'll we're, we're, we're be happy to, to do this again. And uh, I really appreciate everyone's attention. Everyone, you know, let me say, 98% stayed during this hour. So I really appreciate everyone's um, engagement uh, and energy towards this. Um, and I know there was lots of different disciplines from different geography across the country and the globe and from adjuncts to deans. So thank you all so, so much for your attention. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We're happy to take suggestions and uh, thank you all so, so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lanny. I uh, really appreciate everyone joining us today and we're really happy to uh, partner with Intellective Statistics on this webinar. And uh, we're looking forward to having more uh, series uh, just to go over and how to improve your quantitative, quantitative research skills um, in the social sciences and nursing and health sciences, uh, because we know there's so much work being done in this area and we want you to be as prepared as possible for yourself, for your own research, as well as for your graduate students. Uh, so uh, we, uh, please take a look at your email over the next couple of days. We'll send out uh, just some additional information on um, what what else you would like to cover. We'll, we'll, we'll send out a survey so you can tell us um, what you'd like covered next time around, as well as just any additional information to learn more about on this topic. Uh, but again, thank you for joining today. And thank you again, Dr. Lenny. My pleasure. Thank you all. Melissa, thank you. Andrew, thank you. And mostly thank you to everyone that's seeking to improve their own development uh, in, in academia or, or in their own research. So hooray to all of you as well. And with that, I'll say have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.